Hello all, before we begin this episode, I would just like to ask our listeners to like and subscribe to this channel as it will help us out. We are fairly new on YouTube and it would help us a lot if you did so. You can also comment if you prefer. Thank you. Welcome in the Great Khan's Tent. History, Literature and Storytelling in the Great Khan's Tent is now available on YouTube. You can find us using this podcast name. Fear not, listeners, episodes will still be released on this podcast first, and it is only after a delay of a week that I will upload them onto YouTube. You can still find us on all your podcast providers first. Are you interested in getting the book you just published reviewed? Writing some piece of literature and need help getting it out there and promoted? Interested in sharing what piece of literature we should cover next? Well, fret not. In the Great Khan's Tent is now available on Patreon, where your contribution can help in growing this podcast. For as low as $3 a month, a price less than a good, and I mean good, cup of coffee, you can help contribute to the growth of this podcast. Every bit helps, but as always, it is not necessary to do so, but will be appreciated. Find the Patreon link on our website, on our social media accounts, or email us and we can send it to you. Thank you. In each episode, you may notice that a background track has been provided, like this. This is a result of my editorial decision to include a background track when there is some interaction between a human and a jinn, an otherworldly being that is a common race that frequently appears in these tales. If you have any suggestions, comments, or complaints, please be sure to email us at all lowercase in the great Hans tent at gmail.com. That is in the great Hans tent at gmail.com. We would love to hear from our listeners. Thank you for listening, and now, on with the show. In this episode, we end the story cycle of the porter, the three ladies of Baghdad, and the three dervishes with Night 19, and begin another story cycle, the story of the three apples with Night 20. Within the three apples cycle, we start the story of Nur Din Ali and his son, and of Shamsuddin Muhammad and his daughter. What is interesting about both the end of the first cycle and the start of the second is that there is a considerable change in the attitude that is displayed by Harun al-Rashid. Instead of the calm, reasonable Khalif, Harun al-Rashid is seen continually threatening his wazir Jafar al-Barmaki with death of not only himself but that of his entire family a fact which may reflect on the actual execution of him and his entire family in 803 CE. Furthermore, this may reflect the fact that these stories may have been created, written down, or modified soon after the first Abbasid civil war of 811 to 813 CE. This is a particularly important view to consider as the references to Al-Amin may refer to the condition Baghdad was in under his reign. This aspect will be explored in the upcoming special episode. Auzubillah min ash-shaytan nirajim bismillahirrahman nirrahim In the name of God, the compassionate, the merciful. Praise be to God, the beneficent King, the creator of the universe, who has raised the heavens without pillars and spread out the earth as a bed. And blessings and peace be upon the Lord of Apostles, our Lord and Master Muhammad Wasallam, and his family. Blessings and peace, enduring and constant unto the day of judgment. Of a verity, the doings of the ancients become a lesson to those that follow after, so that men look upon the admonitory events that have happened to others and take warning, and come to the knowledge of what befell bygone peoples, and are restrained thereby. So glory be to him who hath appointed the things that have been done aforetime for an example to those that have come after.
And of these admonitory instances are the histories called the Thousand and One Nights, with all their store of illustrious fables and relations. Shirzad continued, The Khalifa was astonished at this story, and ordered it to be recorded in a book as an authentic history, and deposited the book in his library. Night 19 Morning now dawned, and Shahrazad broke off from what she had been allowed to say. Then, when it was the nineteenth night, she continued, I have heard, O auspicious Shahanshah, that the Khalif ordered their story to be written down in the records and placed in the royal archives. And he said to the first lady, Knowest thou where the jinniyah who enchanted thy sister, is to be found. She answered, O prince of the faithful, she gave me a lock of her hair, and said, When thou desirest my presence, burn a few of these hairs, and I will be with thee quickly, though I should be beyond Mount Kaf. Bring then the hair, said the Khalifa, the lady therefore produced it, and the Khalifa, taking it, burned a portion of it. And when the order had diffused itself, the palace shook, and they heard the sound of thunder, and lo, the jinnia appeared before them. She was a Muslimah, and therefore greeted the Khalifa by saying, Peace be on thee, O Khalifa of Allah, to which he replied, on you be peace and the mercy of Allah and his blessings. She then said, Know that this lady hath conferred on me a benefit for which I am unable to requite her, for she rescued me from death by killing my enemy, and I, having seen what her sisters had done to her, determined to take vengeance upon them. Therefore I transformed them by enchantment into two bitches, and indeed I had wished rather to kill them, fearing lest they should trouble her, but I was afraid that this might distress her, so then I thought that I should take revenge by turning them by magic into dogs. Now if thou desirest their restoration, O Prince of the Faithful, I will restore them as a favor to thee and to her for I am one of the true believers. Do so, said the Khalifa, and then we will enter upon the consideration of the affair of the lady who hath been beaten, and examine her case, and if her veracity be established, I will take vengeance for her upon him who hath oppressed her. The jinnia replied, O Prince of the Faithful, I will guide thee to the discovery of him who acted thus to this lady, and oppressed her, and took her property. He is thy nearest relation. She then took a cup of water, and having pronounced a spell over it, sprinkled the faces of the two bitches, saying, Be restored to your original forms whereupon they became again two young ladies. Extolled be the perfection of their creator. Having done this, the jinnia said, O prince of the faithful, he who beat the lady is thy son, Al-Amin, the brother of Al-Mamun. He had heard of her great beauty and set a trap for her, but he married her legally and was within his rights to beat her as he had imposed a condition on her and got her to swear a solemn oath that she would do nothing to break it. Break it she did, however, and he was going to kill her, but for the fear of Allah he beat her instead and sent her back to her own house, and she proceeded to relate what had happened. This is the story of the second woman, but Allah knows better. When the Khalifa heard what she had to say and learned of how the woman had come to be beaten, he was filled with astonishment and said, Glory be to Allah the Exalted, the Omnipotent, who has granted me the favor 
of learning this girl's history and rescuing these two others from sorcery and torture. By Allah, I shall do something that will be recorded after me. Praise be to Allah for the restoration of these two bitches which hath been effected through my means. And immediately he summoned before him his son Al-Amin and inquired of him the history of the lady. And he related to him the truth. He then sent for Qadis and witnesses and the first lady and her two sisters who had been transformed into bitches he married to the three medicants who had been related that they were the sons of sultans and these he made chamberlains of his court appointing them all that they required and allotting them apartments in the palace of Baghdad. The lady who had been beaten he restored to his son Al-Amin, giving her a large property and ordering that the house should be rebuilt in a more handsome style. Lastly, the lady Catrus he took as his own wife. He admitted her at once to his own apartment, and on the following day, he appointed her a separate lodging for herself with female slaves to wait upon her. He also allotted to her a regular income and afterwards built for her a palace. The people were astonished at his magnanimity, generosity, and wisdom. His orders were that all these stories should be written down. Dunyazad said to her sister, Shehrazad, by Allah, no one has heard so fine and pleasant a story. But tell me another to pass what remains of this wakeful night. Willingly, Shehrazad replied, if the Shehenshah gives me leave. Tell your story at once, he said, and she began. The Story of the Three Apples It is said, Shehenshah of the Age and Lord of our times, that one night after the adventure above described, the Khalifa Harun al-Rashid said to Jafar his vizier, We will go down tonight into the city and inquire respecting the affairs of those who are at present in authority, and him against whom any one shall complain, we will displace, and promote those to whom they are grateful. Jafar replied, I hear and obey, and when the Khalifa had gone forth with him and Masrur, and they had passed through several of the market streets, they proceeded along a lane, and saw there an old man with a net and basket upon his head and a staff in his hands, walking at his leisure and reciting these verses. They say to me, Thou shinest amongst mankind by thy knowledge, like the moonlight night. But I answer, abstain from thus addressing me, since there is no knowledge without power. For if they would pawn me, and my knowledge with me, and all my papers and ink horn too, for one day's food, they would never find the pledge accepted to the day of judgment, and such a bargain would be thought contemptible. As for the poor, and his condition, and his whole life, how full of trouble, the poor, their state, their lives, how dark they are with troubles. In the summer he fails to earn his food, and in the winter he warms himself over the fire pot. Street dogs attack them, and they are the butt of every despicable man. The dogs follow him wherever he goes, and any reviler and he cannot repel him. When one of them complains about his lot, there is none to excuse him among all mankind. If he states his case and proves himself wronged, the judge will not admit his plea. Such then being the poor man's life, his fittest place is in the burial ground. The Khalifa, when he heard his recitation, said to Jafar, Observe this poor man, and consider these verses, for they indicate his necessity. Then approaching the man, he said to him, O Sheikh, what is thine occupation? O my master, answered the old man, I am a fisherman, and have a family to maintain, and I went forth from my house at noon, 
and have remained until now, but Allah hath allotted me nothing wherewith to obtain food for my household. Therefore I have hated myself and wished for death. Wilt thou, said the Khalifa, return to us to the river and station thyself on the bank of the Tigris and cast thy net for my luck? If thou wilt do so, I will purchase of thee whatever cometh up for a hundred pieces of gold. The fisherman rejoiced when he heard these words and said, On my head be your commands, I will return with you. So he went again to the river and cast his net, and having waited until it sank, drew the cords and dragged back the net, and there came up in it a chest locked and heavy. When the Khalifa saw it, he felt its weight and found it to be heavy, and he gave a hundred pieces of gold to the fisherman who went away. The Khalifa himself then left, while Masrur, assisted by Jafar, took up the chest and conveyed it in company with the Khalifa to the palace where they lighted the candles and placed the chest before the Khalifa. Jafar and Masrur then broke it open and they found in it a basket of palm leaves sewed up with red worsted and they cut the threads and saw within it a piece of carpet and lifting this up they found beneath it an izhar and when they had taken up the izhar they discovered under it a damsel like molten silver killed and cut in pieces when the khalifa beheld this tears ran down his cheeks and looking towards jafar he exclaimed o dog of viziers shall people be murdered in my time and be thrown into the river and become burdens upon my responsibility by allah i must retaliate for this damsel upon him who killed her and put him to death dog of a vizier are people to be murdered and thrown into the river during my reign so that i am to be held responsible for them on the day of judgment by allah i must make the murderer pay for this girl's death and i shall put him to the most cruel of deaths then said he to jafar in his furious rage by the truth of my descent from the khalifas of the sons of al abbas if thou do not bring to me him who killed this woman that i may avenge her upon him i will crucify thee at the gates of my palace together with forty of thy kinsmen and the khalifa was enraged grant me said jafar a delay of three days i grant thee the delay replied the khalifa jafar then went forth from his presence and took his route through the city sorrowful and saying within himself how shall i discover him who killed this damsel that i may take him before the khalifa and if i take to him any other person he will become a weight upon my conscience i do not know what to do for three days he remained in his house and on the fourth day the khalifa sent to summon him and when he had presented himself before him said to him where is the murderer of the damsel o prince of the faithful answered jafar am i acquainted with things hidden from the senses that i should know who is her murderer commander of the faithful am i the monitor of murder victims that i should know who killed the girl the khalifa incensed at this answer gave orders to crucify him at the gate of his palace and commanded a crier to proclaim throughout the streets of baghdad whoever desirous to amuse himself by seeing the crucifixion of jafar al-barmaki the vizier of the khalifa and the crucifixion of his kinsmen at the gate of the khalifa's palace let him come forth and amuse himself so the people came forth from every quarter to see the crucifixion of jafar and his kinsmen and they knew not the cause of this the khalifa then gave 
orders to set up the crosses, and they did so, and placed the vizier and his kingsmen beneath to crucify them, and were waiting the Khalifa's permission, while the people wept for Jafar and his relatives. But while they were thus waiting, a handsome and neatly dressed young man, with a face bright as the moon, dark eyes, radiant forehead, red cheeks, and a mole like a disc of ambergris, came forward quickly through the crowd. He cleared a way for himself through the people and kept on until he stood before Jafar, and approaching the vizier, said to him, Safety to thee from this predicament, O chief of the emirs, and refuge of the poor. It was I who killed the woman whom ye found in the chest. Kill me therefore for her, and retaliate her death upon me, lord of the emirs, and shelterer of the poor. You are saved from this plight. When Jafar heard these words, he rejoiced for his own deliverance, and grieved for the young man. But while he was speaking to him, lo, an old sheikh presented hastily through the crowd to him, and the young man, and having saluted them, said, O vizier, believe not the words of this young man, for no one killed the damsel but myself, therefore retaliate her death upon me. The young man, however, said, O vizier, this is an old man, imbecile through age, he knoweth not what he saith, it was I who killed her, avenge her, therefore upon me. O my son, said the sheikh, thou art young, and wilt find pleasure in the world, and I am old and satiated with the world, and I have had my fill of it. I will be a ransom for thee, and for the vizier and his kinsmen, and no one killed the damsel but myself. By Allah, therefore, hasten to retaliate upon me, and I conjure you by Allah to hang me quickly, as there is no life for me now that she is dead. My lord, great vizier, don't believe what this young man says. No one but I killed the girl, so avenge her death on me. If you do not, I will demand justice from you in the presence of Almighty Allah. Vizier, said the youth, this is the maundering of an old man who doesn't know what he is saying. It was I and I alone who killed her, so make me pay for her death. On witnessing this scene, the vizier was astonished, and he took the young man and the sheikh to the khalifa. He kissed the ground and said, O prince of the faithful, the murderer of the damsel hath come. Where is he? said the Khalifa. This young man, answered Jafar, saith, I am the murderer, and this sheikh accuseth him of falsehood, and saith, Nay, but I am the murderer. The Khalifa, looking towards the sheikh and the young man, said, Which of you killed this damsel? The young man answered, No one killed her but myself. And the sheikh said also, No one killed her but myself. The Khalifa therefore said to Jafar, Take them both and crucify them. If the murderer be one, replied Jafar, to kill the other would be unjust. The young man then said, By him who raised the heaven and spread out the earth, it was I who killed the damsel. And then he gave an account of the manner of his killing her, and described what the Khalifa had found. The Khalifa, therefore, was convinced that the young man was he who had killed the damsel, and he was astonished, and said, What was the cause of thy killing this damsel unjustly, and of thy confessing the murder without being beaten, and thy saying, Retaliate her death upon me. The young man answered as follows, Know, O prince of the faithful, that this damsel was my wife, and the daughter of my uncle. This sheikh was her father, and is my uncle. I married her when she was a virgin, and Allah blessed me with three male children by her, and she loved me 
and served me, and I saw in her no evil. She used to love me and wait on me, and I saw no fault in her, while I, for my part, loved her dearly. At the commencement of this month, she was attacked by a severe illness, and I brought to her the physicians who attended her until her health returned to her, and I desired them to send her to the bath. But she said to me, I want something before I enter the bath, for I have a longing for it. What is it? I said. She answered, I have a longing for an apple to smell it and take a bite from it. So I went out immediately into the city and searched for the apple and would have brought it had its price been a piece of gold, but I could not find one. I passed the next night full of thought, and when the morning came, I quitted my house again and went about to all the gardens one after another yet I found none in them. There met me, however, an old gardener, of whom I inquired for the apple, and he said to me, O oh my son, this is a rare thing, and not to be found here, nor anywhere except in the gardens of the prince of the faithful at al-Basra, and preserved there for the Khalifa. I returned therefore to my wife, and my love for her so constrained me that I prepared myself and journeyed fifteen days by day and night in going and returning, and brought her three apples which I purchased of the gardener at al-Basra for three pieces of gold, and going in, I handed them to her, but she was not pleased by them, and left them by her side. She was then suffering from a violent fever and she continued ill during a period of ten days. After this she recovered her health, and I went out and repaired to my shop, and sat there to sell and buy, and while I was thus occupied, at midday there passed by me a black slave, having in his hand an apple with which he was playing. So I said to him, Whence didst thou get this apple? For I would procure one like it. Upon which he laughed and answered, I got it from my sweetheart. I had been absent, and came and found her ill, and she had three apples, and she said to me, My unsuspecting husband journeyed to al-Basra for them, and bought them for three pieces of gold, and I took this apple from her. When I heard the words of the slave, O prince of the faithful, the world became black before my face, and I shut up my shop and returned to my house, deprived of my reason by excessive rage. I found not the third apple, and said to her, Where is the apple? She answered, I know not whither it is gone. I was convinced thus that the slave had spoken the truth, and I arose and took a knife, and throwing myself upon her bosom, plunged the knife into her. Then I cut off her head and limbs, and put them in the basket in haste, and covered them with the izhar, over which I laid a piece of carpet, sewed up the whole thing. Then I put the basket in the chest, and having locked this, conveyed it on my mule, and threw it with my own hands into the Tigris. And now continued the young man, I conjure thee by Allah, O Prince of the Faithful, to hasten my death in retaliation for her murder, as I dread otherwise her appeal for vengeance upon me on the day of resurrection. For when I had thrown her into the Tigris without the knowledge of anyone, I returned to my house and found my eldest boy crying, though he knew not what I had done to his mother. So I said to him, What maketh thee cry? And he answered, I took one of the apples that my mother had, and went down with it into the street to play with my brothers, and a tall black slave snatched it from me, and said to me, Whence came this to thee? I answered him, My father made a journey for it, and brought it from al-Basra for the sake of my mother, for she is sick. He brought three apples for three pieces of gold, but he took it from me and beat me, and went away with it. 
and I am afraid that my mother may beat me on account of the apple. When I heard my son's story, I discovered that the slave had forged a lie against the daughter of my uncle and found that she had been killed unjustly. And as I was weeping bitterly for what I had done, this sheikh, my uncle and her father came to me and I informed him of the event and he seated himself by me and wept. We wept until midnight and continued mourning for her five days, ceasing not to the present day to bewail her death. By the honor of thine ancestors, therefore, hasten my death to retaliate her murder upon me. The Khalifa wondered at the young man's story and said, By Allah, I will not put to death any but the wicked slave, for the young man is excusable, and I shall do a deed which will cure the sick and please the glorious Sultan. Night 20 Morning now dawned, and Shahrazad broke off from what she had been allowed to say. Then, when it was the twentieth night, she continued, I have heard, O auspicious Shahanshah, that the caliph swore that he would hang no one but the slave, as what the young man had done was excusable. Then, looking towards Jafar, he said to him, Bring before me this wicked slave, who hath been the cause of the catastrophe, or if thou bring him not, thou shalt be put to death in his stead. So the vizier departed, weeping and saying, Whence shall I bring him? Not every time that the jar is struck, doth it escape being broken. Twice I have been threatened with death. The pitcher does not always escape unbroken. I have no stratagem to employ in this affair. There is nothing that I can do about this, but he who delivered me in the first case may deliver me in the second. By Allah, I will not go out from my house for three days, and the truth whose perfection be extolled will do what he willeth. So he remained in his house three days, and on the fourth day he caused the Qadi to be brought, and made his testamentary arrangements, and as he was bidding farewell to his children, and weeping low, the messenger of the Khalifa came and said to him, The prince of the faithful is in a most violent rage, and hath sent me to thee, and he hath sworn that this day shall not pass until thou art put to death, if thou do not bring to him the slave. On hearing this, Jafar wept, and his children wept with him, and when he had bidden them all farewell, except his youngest daughter, he approached her for the same purpose. He loved her more than all his other children, and he pressed her to his bosom, and wept at the thought of his separation from her. But in doing this, he felt something round in her pocket, and said to her, What is in thy pocket? She answered, O oh my father, it is an apple, inscribed with the name of our lord, the Khalif. Our slave Rehan brought it, and I have had it for days. He would not give it to me until he had received from me two dinars. At the mention of the slave and the apple, Jafar rejoiced and exclaimed, O oh Allah, whose deliverance is near at hand, O oh ready dispeller of trouble, and immediately he ordered the slave should be brought before him. He was therefore brought in, and when he said to him, Whence came this apple? O oh my master, he answered, by Allah, if lies can save a man once, truth can save him twice. I didn't steal it from the imperial palace or from the commander of the faithful's orchard. I went out five days ago and entering one of the by streets of the city, I saw some children playing and one of them had this apple and I snatched it from him and beat him and he cried and said, that belongs to my mother, and she is sick. 
she wanted my father to bring her an apple and he made the journey to al basra and brought back for her three apples from which he brought for three pieces of gold and i took this to play with it then he cried again but paying no regard to him i took it away and brought it hither and my little mistress bought it of me for two pieces of gold when he had heard this story jafar was filled with wonder at discovering that this distressing event and the murder of the damsel had been occasioned by his slave and he took the slave and went with him to the khalifa and ordered that the story should be committed to writing and published jafar then said to him wonder not o prince of the faithful at his tale for it is not more extraordinary than the story of the vizier nuruddin ali the egyptian and shamsuddin muhammad his brother what story said the khalifa can be more wonderful than this o prince of the faithful replied jafar i will not relate it to thee unless on the condition that thou exempt my slave from the punishment of death the khalifa said if it is really more remarkable than what has just happened i shall grant you his life but if not then i shall have him killed and jafar thereupon commenced his relation of the story as follows the story of nuruddin and his son and of shamsuddin and his daughter know o prince of the faithful that there was in the old days in egypt in cairo a sultan just and upright and beneficent who loved the poor and would sit with men of learning and who had a wise and well-informed vizier possessing a knowledge of the affairs of the world and of the art of government with a knowledge of affairs and of administration this minister was an aged man and he had two sons like two moons the name of the elder was shamsuddin muhammad and that of the younger nuruddin ali and the latter was more distinguished than the former by handsomeness and comeliness there was no one in his day more handsome so that the fame of his charms spread throughout the neighboring regions and some of the inhabitants of those parts traveled to his country merely to obtain a sight of him and it came to pass that their father died and the sultan mourned for him and turning his regards towards the two sons took them into his favor investing them with robes of honor and saying to them do not be distressed for you will take your father's place ye too are instated in your father's office at which they rejoiced and kissing the ground before him they observed the ceremonies of mourning for their father during a period of a whole month and entered upon the office of the vizier each of them discharging the duties of this station for a week at a time and whenever the sultan had a desire to go forth on a journey he took one of them with him in the great khan's tent is now available on coffee if you are interested in supporting this podcast please click on the link available on our many social media platforms or email us why not donate to our coffee to show your appreciation every bit helps and we thank you for your continued support we love that our listeners love listening to us welcome to the vocabulary section for episode 14 let us look at some of the terms that were used in this episode izhar also known as a futa wizhara or maktab izhar is a clothing garment typically worn by men as a lower section of their garment. Worsted, a smooth, compact yarn from long wool fibers used especially for firm, napeless fabrics, carpeting, or knitting. Inkhorn, small portable bottle as of horn for holding ink. Al-Amin, 
Abu Musa Muhammad ibn Harun al-Rashid, 787-24 till 24th or 25th September 813 CE. Abbasid Khalif from 809 to 813 CE. Killed in the civil war with his half-brother Al-Mamun. Al-Mamun. Abu al-Abbas Abdullah ibn Harun al-Rashid. 14th September 786 to 9th August 833 CE. 7th Abbasid Khalif from 813 to 833 CE. Promoted the translation movement, the flowering of learning and the sciences in Baghdad. And also known for the resumption of large-scale warfare with the Byzantine Empire. Nuruddin. Arabic name means brightness of the faith. Shamsuddin, Arabic name means son of religion. Now let us look at the vocabulary section for this episode. Wherewith, archaic word means with or by means of which or that or by which, used with an infinitive. Reviler. Subject to abuse or to use abusive language. Veracity. Conforming with truth or fiction or devotion to the truth or power of conveying or perceiving truth or something true. Extolled. To praise highly. Maundering. To speak indistinctly or disconnectedly or to grumble. Conferred. Have discussion or exchange opinions, or grant a title, degree, benefit, or right. Requite. To make return for, or to repay, or to make retaliation for, or to make suitable return for a benefit or service or for an injury. Satiated. To satisfy fully or to excess. Comeliness. Suitability or proportion or not homely or plain. This episode has been written, edited, and produced by Saf Big. Thank you for listening. I hope you have a wonderful day and or night. And may the journeys on which you are set upon be fruitful. Thank you for listening.